Hi everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you tonight? Um, black and I'm proud. Great. Great. <laughs> I feel like that fits with the theme of the world right now. Definitely, definitely. Um, a lot has happened since we last did an episode, I guess. I don't know, we were kind of, we, we kind of talked about uh, with Kimber some of the things that have been going on in our last episode. But in this episode, we have a couple of things that we're wanting to focus on. Uh, first off, Coco has been in Portland for a year, officially. Officially a year, and I did not ever go back to Colorado except for once during Christmas. Um, I did it because uh, I just started a new job, and me and my husband, we went down to Denver, and we were there for literally about eight hours, and that was it. And then we Dang. came back. But yeah, I, but the whole time I've been here in Portland, um, I've made a trip to Seattle. Um, I got married. Um, I went to California once. I think we went to California, didn't we? Yeah. We yeah. Did. We yeah. went to San Francisco. Yeah. I went to San Francisco. Oh yeah. Cause mm-hmm. then we ate that good food. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So, but I mean, so I haven't just been stuck in Oregon and of course I do work in Washington, mm-hmm. um, for my boy job. So yeah. yeah, I've been here for a year. Even though you've lived in Portland, you've kind of been all over the place. And I think that's been the fun thing about living here is that we are close to other states um, and other other cities that we haven't really been before. Because you hadn't been to San Francisco before, right? Or Seattle. No, I hadn't been to San Francisco or Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been kind of crazy, all the cool places I've gotten to see and all the cool things I've gotten to do. Living in Portland is fantastic for that oh yeah especially the beach yeah and the food oh the food the <laughs> food is so good i've gained so much weight since i've been here i've literally gained 20 pounds since i lived here and i was already fat it's hard to like especially if you're trying to save money it's hard to not just like eat out here yeah seriously uber eats is the death of my budget for real <laughs> for real Okay, so I have a few questions for you since you kind of interviewed me last time when we did this about my one year. Mm -hmm. Um, I have just a few questions for you just about your experience here and what it's been like for the past year. So my first one is, um, what does it feel to be celebrated in a community as an entertainer? Because I know that that wasn't always necessarily the case in Grand Junction. Um, I've seen a lot of success here, actually, when it Mm -hmm. came to who I am as a drag entertainer. Uh, People have opinions on my drag, but that's also because there is a bigger drag community. Mm -hmm. Um, I I miss the amount of money and the my name and lights in Grand Junction, Colorado. You answered my third question. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I didn't ask you what you missed. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we'll get to it later then. I mean, but like, but here, what I really like is the fact that um, I've been able to perform as much as I wanted to. So my dream, mm-hmm. and I've never really actually, I don't even think I said this to Donna before, but I wanted to be able to do shows Monday through Friday. Mm-hmm. Not every day, but what I mean is be able to get off of work, get my face painted, and do a gig on a Tuesday. Yeah, I always wanted to be able to do that because all those girls in Denver could do that, and I couldn't. And so um, I was really, like, so even that, like, being able to put my best foot forward and then come up with the creative ideas and mixes um, and whatever have really, like, helped me feel that lifestyle. And then Camp Wanna Kiki helped, of course, too, mm-hmm. making me feel like I was really appreciate it for my craft and i've had a lot of positive feedback here i've noticed too that just like in general people respond more positively towards you wanting to open the uh floor for conversation as well where you were kind of met with a bit more backlash um back in junction yeah i definitely was met with a lot more backlash Mm -hmm. so here people are wanting to um and they'll actually ask me to like sometimes like they don't want me to put forth the emotional labor if i choose to be that girl i choose to be that girl and where i like speak my mind and have those conversations but i don't have to do it because other people will do it for me um i know that you could probably call those people white saviors and to agree they might be but it's also really nice to not have to speak on every single issue every single time yeah yeah Yeah. definitely um what would you say has been your biggest drag related challenge since moving Um, My biggest drag-related challenge is the fact that um, I'm going to talk about money again, but not really money, is that people here are hungry for the gigs that pay Mm -hmm. because there's not many of them. So even though the drag here, in my opinion, is not oversaturated, I really don't think it's oversaturated here. Um, There's just not enough 
paying gigs Mm -hmm. for the amount of entertainers that, you know, perform here. Like, there's plenty of gigs to get into in the middle of the week, um, but not all of them are going to pay good coin. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I guess I'd have to say that. Yeah. Um, So what would be, like, a singular piece of advice that you'd give for a new entertainer specifically to this scene? Um, I would say know your worth. Um, Understand who you are before you put yourself out there. Like, if somebody... And what I mean was new, not like a new entertainer, but somebody new to the scene. Yeah. Um, yeah, like just make sure you know your worth because it comes off really awkward um, if you're trying to make other people validate you, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like come in, be confident, do your number, and people will respond to you. I remember the first time I saw Tina G perform, I was so utterly floored by her. Oh, yeah. Um, like, I didn't even really talk to her in the dressing room, and she's just so stunning. And every time I take pictures next to her, I look like an effing troll. Oh, and the definition of knowing your worth, too, Tina G. Because she makes, you know, she has all these custom-made outfits that I'm pretty sure she makes, and she has just very nicely polished drag, and she came into the scene knowing that she had that full package too. She really did. Mm-hmm. Like I was I'm just utterly impressed by her constantly because of that. Yeah. Um so going back to the question <laughs> um of what you miss, I guess about our previous scene in Junction, what are what are some of the biggest things that you miss about that scene? I miss Natalie Simone, um the third of our girl group little tricks. Sure. Um, I had so much fun performing as the three of us because I felt like we got to have like our moment, like Donna picked all of our songs. Um, <laughs> cause <laughs> she did. Um, they were usually always little mix songs anyway. Yeah. What I mean, usually they were always little mix songs. <laughs> they were, they were, and we could never branch out of that. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was fun to do that. And it was fun to take over a scene and be successful together. Mm-hmm. It was fun to be in this highlight of like this, like it was cool to have my name in lights. It was cool yeah. to be, um, we were the three most popular drag queens in the entire city. We were the three most paid drag queens in the entire city. Um, you know, we owned our shit and it was great. Like it was cool to know that no matter where I went, somebody probably knew who I was or what I was about. And I mm-hmm. kind of liked that. I mean, that's kind of what fame is to a degree. But in this regard, it was a small it's small town fame. Mm-hmm. So it didn't really come with any benefits except for maybe I didn't have to pay for my drinks or yeah. something. And we got to travel for some fun gigs, too. Oh, yeah. The traveling was cool. But that um, mi- that's not necessarily a junction thing. No. I miss traveling with that group. But to the truly about the scene that I miss... I do miss the fact that I got to be creative and create shows that I wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, Because what I've noticed here is that I have to create shows that people want. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as much so like a passion project as it could have been in Junction. Yeah. Well, and I think the fun thing about that was that there was an audience that um, we were still developing kind of their palette for drag, so we could experiment with different shows that we wanted to introduce. Yeah, my worst show was my country show. (laughs) I threw a country show and nobody showed up. It was awful. And none of the entertainers were super enthusiastic about it either. Oh, it was rough. I mean, I was not. (laughs) It was rough. Oh my gosh, it was so rough. But I do, I miss the comfortability of that scene because I was in it for so long. Mm -hmm. This scene still feels very new and volatile to Mm -hmm. me because it's new. It's not that people are mean or rude or anything. It's just the scene I'm in now, like, I don't know it like the back of my hand. I don't know all the show producers. I don't know where all the dressing rooms are. Um, There's still gigs I haven't performed at or venues I haven't performed at. There's shows I desperately want to be in. Like, I still want to be in Hope Glue. Yeah. Um, which I was talking to Mars about being in that, but then COVID happened. So, yeah. but that was one of my dream shows to be in. I had a great concept for it, and it didn't pan out. Yeah, because yeah. of COVID. Well, is there anything else you want to leave our listeners with, just kind of about um, your year here that um, you want to say? Yeah. So I think, um, and Donna and I kind of talked about this, I think, in an earlier episode, but I want to touch on this real briefly. Being here, I've unpacked a lot of trauma. Yes. Like, I, like, honestly, it almost makes me teary-eyed. Like, I have unpacked so many negative things that happened to me in Grand Junction, Colorado. And I know some of our friends from Junction listen to this, and I'm not trying to bash in that place every time I say this. 
but I went through some really horrible things yes. and it hurt my heart. I, you know, I went through a divorce there. Like I, you know, went through some really terrible racial incidents there after starting BLM and like Black Lives Matter for those listening. Um, I did like every day I live here, I'm unpacking a wealth of trauma and and it's so good for me and it's so healthy for me to be unpacking it. Like it's not bottled inside of me anymore. Like who I am two years ago to who I am today is completely and utterly different because I've had the ability to unpack some of these disgusting and horrible things that I kept locked in a box and always told myself, I'll get to that later. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like a therapist would have a field day with this box. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mine is, and I can definitely <laughs> relate. <laughs> and so, the, so, yeah, the last thing I want to say about it is Every day I wake up, I'm unpacking bits and pieces here. I've even sent out, like, in AA, sometimes you send out your apology letters. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've i done that, actually. I've reached out to some people. I'm like, I was a monster to you because I wasn't happy with anything really around my life here. Mm-hmm. And But the one positive I always leave is, like, Junction did... I wouldn't have met Donatello without Junction. I wouldn't have met my husband without Junction. I wouldn't have met my best friend Kyle Kimball without Junction. So Junction brought me some great and amazing things and people um, and some great adventures too. Yeah. But it also brought me a lot of trauma that is seeming, obviously, is going to take more than a year to get through. Ditto. Ditto. (laughs) So, um, Donna, I forgot to ask you because we've been talking about myself for so long. (laughs) Um, how are you doing tonight? You know what, Coco? I will let you know after this brief commercial break. Have you ever been drunk off your ass at a gay bar during a drag show and thought, You know what? I can do that. I can work too hard. Maybe if I control the yellow shots, I can have more for myself. Then have we got a show for you. Cooking Up a Queen. A brand new limited series brought to you by the CD Studios. Over the course of a 10-week run, you'll be brought into the flagrant and fanciful world of queer nightlife. With Camp One and Kiki finalist Coco Jim Holiday and rising star of the Portland drag scene, Touche Douche. These two will delve deep into what it takes to be a drag entertainer, the do's and don'ts of newcomers on the scene, as well as discuss topics that you would never think would come up until you're a cross-dresser on the corner of 5th and Broadway. Trust me, you're going to want to pay special attention for that one because, um, it's a lot. Make sure to tune in starting May 31st every Sunday for Cooking Up a Queen, available wherever you podcast. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. You know what, Coco? I am just a little bit emotionally tired because I feel like every time I log on to Facebook, it's a new debate. <laughs> <laughs> with someone oh, true. <laughs> it hasn't been you know it's it's been a, a lot of uh talking uh to people and having very tough conversations with people yeah it really has yeah. been i got into one today actually just real briefly i got into one I, I called you about it too yeah but they deleted the status and then reposted one saying like oh i guess i'm a racist or blah 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 and so i wrote underneath there that basically said hey Here's the information. Mm -hmm. Like, because people want to say all day long, just as a side note, um, that nothing good comes from violence. Uh And I always want to be like, like, we all know everybody uses the Stonewall thing. And but you have to remember, and this is what people don't quite know about our history. After Martin Luther King was assassinated, Mm -hmm. um, there were five days of very abrupt and violent riots yeah which sparked the civil rights act a lot of people also don't know that martin luther king was considered one of the biggest enemies to the fbi at the time when the movement was happening back then Mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't bring that up they act as though it was just at, at least they try to portray it through history as though it was just a bunch of peaceful protests and that's how things got done when that's not the case at all no 
Um, and actually, what's even interesting is like, so even though Selma wasn't technically a riot, the only reason that Selma became so known is because it was videotaped with the police being violent to the protesters. Mm -hmm. Like, so once again, violence. What, I was listening to an abolitionist today who talked about, um, they said this quote that I thought was great. Um, and I'm going to try to get it right. It said, so do you consider yourself, they were saying they were tired of hearing, are you a Martin Luther King or you are Malcolm X? And they said, what does it even matter? They both were assassinated. Yeah. And I yeah. was like, yeah. like, that was insane. So it doesn't matter if black people were doing it peacefully or a little mm -hmm. bit more out there. They both were assassinated. And I was like, that's. That, that was a really good quote. Yeah. Very quick, too, for our listeners. Um, we're co in constant reminder of what's happening in the world. I don't know if you can hear the helicopter that's outside our window right now. Um, but this is something that, since these protests are, have started, that we've um, kind of just been... It, it's been present. So we've, we've always had that reminder. So I think it's very different um, in this state of the world if you live in a city where these protests are happening because there is that constant reminder of what's going on. And it's good. You know, it's good that we have that because then we know how to act. We know that um, these things are still happening in our world and they're going to continue to happen until change is implemented. And that's really what we want the second... Oh, wow. That is very loud. Yeah, that is very loud. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear that, listeners. Yeah. But... The, well, because we live pretty close to downtown Portland, mm -hmm. and so it might mean that there is a protest happening right now downtown. Yeah. But anyway, um, I, I wanted the second part of this episode to focus on basically what defunding the police means behind this movement that the protesters have been uh, basically wanting to push forward. Um, yeah. Um, on right now... Um, and it has changed. Don't, don't Shoot Port Portland uh, came out saying today, um, during their rally today with uh, Care Not Cops, mm -hmm. that it's no, no longer about defunding the police, it's about abolishing the police. Mm -hmm. They changed their tactic today, specifically. Mm -hmm. But in the national movement, it's more about defunding the police. In the national movement, yes. And I feel like um, I was watching, actually, some commentary on it today. Conservatives are very, very scared by that word, abolishing the police, because there's um, the very, uh, the very uh, thought of it is that there's nothing that's going to be put in place after that happens. Yes. Um, Even myself, though, and I will, same, and I, I want to relate to you all with this. Um, yeah. I was listening to a lot of the speakers today, um, and it was triggering. It was very triggering to feel like I didn't have a safety net. If I called 911 and somebody wouldn't come to my rescue. We are told from a very young age that, you know, call the police if, you know, if something's happening, something's negative. You know, if you need help, you call uh -huh. the police. And so when you're hearing people on a microphone, just like you listeners, I bet you're feeling it right now too. Like, but I don't, I want to feel safe. Yeah. I want to feel safe. Yeah, definitely. It's um, a concept that I'm fairly new to. Uh, the, Me as well. The concept of defunding the police, however, has been a concept that's been around since the 90s. It's it's something I've, I've listened to legal professionals that have worked in this, especially in bigger cities like in New York. And the concept of defunding the police and distributing funds to other social services to lessen crime and address root causes is not a new concept. No, it actually it has been around for a while. And this momentum that people are getting because of the death of George Floyd mm -hmm. is actually giving people um, this newfound interest in pushing this forward now. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a good cause to, sorry, obviously it's a tragedy, but this right now is a perfect time to do it because of what Definitely. happened, because it was police violence. Yeah, yeah. And I find it interesting, too, that this movement kind of... Um, came to prominence and kind of started in the 90s because that was also when the Clinton administration was passing sweeping crime legislation that led to the incarceration of a lot of people of color and broke up a lot of families. Um, the crime legislation that was passed in 94 under the Clinton administration um, made it to where there were um, harsher um, mandatory sentences and uh, for for more minor charges um, for, for drug charges, for things like that. So mm -hmm. there were people that were uh, put into this prison system for where the, the punishment didn't necessarily fit the crime. Right. 
Right. And it's so hard to get somebody out of jail, out of prison for those minor crimes. Mm -hmm. Um, There's been a lot of initiatives and grassroots organizations that are doing that today. But not everybody is lucky enough to be one of the lucky few who's chosen to, you know, have somebody pick up your case and be like, wait a second, this was just a small drug charge. Mm -hmm. Like, let's get you out of jail. You have to remember, um, there is this consistent cycle that people... um, I'm going to go on a 10 second tangent here, but literally what happens is when you talk about black on black crime, you have to think about what that actually means. Because number one, black on black crime does not exist. That's a myth. Um, It's just crime. Um, Anybody who lives in any community will probably experience crime from that community. And if you live in a black neighborhood, obviously your crime is going to come from other black people. You live in a white neighborhood, it's going to come from other white people. So when you think about what that crime talks about is then, so you have a dad who was taken to jail and is now in prison for a small drug charge, Mm -hmm. even like smoking weed back in the day. And now you have a mom who's working... Um, who's working two jobs to pay for two kids. So the kids are kind of running wild in the streets and they need support. And so they possibly might get involved with gangs because they do like they have so much free time because their mom is always gone because she can't pay for a sitter. She can't pay for daycare because those services are expensive. And so then you get kids growing up in a system that they're involved in with gangs, which obviously leads to perpetuating the cycle. Now, you can all like because that's not necessarily what the episode's about, but then you end up you end up with a countless number of people continuing to go to jail because we have to break the cycle. We do. We do. And we want to paint a clearer picture. So what defunding the police would mean? It means that we would uh, reallocate funds that would include publicly financed supportive housing, community-based anti-violence programs, trauma services for young people, education, increased school counseling, after school programs, and restorative justice programs, um, and then also more. So th- that's just a short list of where the funds would then be reallocated to um, if the police were to be defunded. I really found interest in the restorative justice aspect. And so what restorative justice means, the foundational princi- principles of restorative justice um, are that crime causes harm and, and justice should focus on repairing that harm. Uh, The people that are most affected by the crime should be able to participate in its resolution, which I wholeheartedly agree with. And um, three, the responsibility of the government is to maintain order and of the community to build peace. So the peace building is focused then on the community and the individuals rather than the government enforcing, which I think is very important and I think is something that aligns with our principles of freedom and autonomy here in the United States as well. So for more information on restorative justice, um, you can check out uh, restorativejustice.org. There's also uh, some really interesting things about defunding um, on clickondetroit.com that uh, talks about what defunding the police and focusing more on community-led and community-based law enforcement would mean. Yeah, so the people out there who are still like, well, you didn't really answer my question. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I feel safe? Mm -hmm. The fact is, it's the last thing that Donna said just now. There'd be community-led law enforcement slash peacekeeping. Community-led law enforcement and peacekeeping really is about your police officers don't necessarily um, respond to a government. They respond to their communities. Mm -hmm. So they are held accountable by their communities, Mm -hmm. not necessarily some unforeseen force, um, which obviously is sent there to oppress you. It's a system like and it's new for me as well. It's a system based on the idea that, hey, we all want justice and we all want to live in a safe environment. I think everybody across the globe wants to live a happy, healthy and safe life. Right. Mm -hmm. So when somebody tries to break that dynamic, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, One, these services are built to try to prevent crime from happening. But obviously crime will happen. So now a crime has been committed. What do we do now? You would have a form of police that's not actually considered police that is dispatched by community members to be able to obviously take care of these situations. Yes. Um, And they and it's still kind of like the police, but not the police. And I know it's kind of hard to explain and it's hard to see in your mind, but that's what would happen in these instances, because it wouldn't be necessarily 
Um, we did find a statistic that police officer, uh, police are called for a lot of, what did Donna say, a lot of mental health issues. Yeah, the majority of 911 calls are to deal with mental health issues. And the fact of the matter is, is the police don't want to be responding to mental health issues because they're not trained. No. They're not trained and equipped to do so. And a lot of the time, those mental health calls... Um, a lot of the times they can end up in people being hurt because they're not trained to deal with the unpredictability of someone who's experiencing a crisis in, in the mental health area. Right. Um, and actually, I have a great example of this. So like mm-hmm. when we lived in Grand Junction, so there was a group called the Victims Advocates. They were actually a subgroup of the Sheriff's Department to where I believe is the Sheriff's Department. Sorry if I got it wrong. But pretty much what happened if like a sexual assault happened or a domestic violence situation happened, um, this group would be called the victim's advocate, obviously, to come and sit and talk with you because police officers aren't trained to not necessarily trained to be able to deal with that emotional trauma in that specific incident. Uh So they bring in an outside person. And I was actually um, privy to one during a queer domestic violence situation. And the victim's advocate was actually a queer male who came in to talk and have the conversations with us. And that was, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We are talking about having professionals who are trained in specific aspects of justice instead of just having this catch-all being police officers because what happens is there's going to be people who make a lot of mistakes yeah and it ends up in the loss of life as we've seen yeah and so an argument that people might say is so why don't we just train our police force more to handle and be equipped to handle these situations well because we've tried that we, we try did. to we try to implement de-escalation services we try to implement surveillance so where people mm-hmm. um, and police officers are wearing body cams but police often don't turn on their body cams and mm-hmm. these de-escalation um, training all of all, everything that we try to implement a lot of times doesn't get used so There's a problem in the system and it does desperately need to be fixed. Um, I also want to point out the fact that defunding also means demilitarization of our police force. The fact of the matter is, in many cities, the police force takes up one third of the entire city budget. One third. One third when that could be going into education, mental health, it could be going into these different community resources. And the police forces across the U.S., blanket, get billions upon billions of dollars to fund them like our army does like our military does Mm -hmm. and the fact of the matter is we are living in a police state by funding at the level that we fund our military and that's something that needs to be changed because we are militarizing our communities and our citizens we definitely do and that we and and i know that people are now thinking but if the if um the bad guys have guns and we defund the police or we disarm police officers then that makes it unfair for them doesn't it that's where de-escalation comes into play. And now hear me out, listeners. I know you're probably thinking, but like, so if somebody's going to shoot somebody, they're going to shoot somebody. Here's the thing, though. De-escalation works. It's proven to work. So if you do have somebody who's pulled a gun on you, oftentimes people don't necess- People have to recognize if you're not armed and your hands are in the air, like the people who are going to most likely shoot you in today's world, it seems like it's police officers. Mm-hmm. You're not armed, your arms are up, and they're shooting you because they have all the power. The thing is, when you're talking to a regular, everyday citizen who's doing something bad, who has um, who has a firearm, if you come at somebody with a de-escalation tactic, saying, like, we want to all get out of here alive, we all want to make it home to our families, we all have kids, wives, you know, husbands, and things like that, and having those techniques in place, mm-hmm. de-escalation truly does work and i know you might not believe me so i urge you all to go out there on the web and do your research yourself de-escalation when it comes to firearms works yeah but right now it doesn't work for police because the police already have the power so when our arms are raised Mm -hmm. and we're saying i can't breathe or please don't shoot they already have the power and they're going to do whatever they want to that's Mm -hmm. why the system is broken and we have to work diligently to change it yeah. Seriously, de-escalation works. Definitely. And I think with this entire defund movement, what we are addressing by reallocating these funds to the places that need it, we are addressing root causes. Root causes of crime. 
poverty yeah. is one of the biggest factors mm -hmm. in creating crime in these communities. So addressing the issues um, of poverty, going in and making sure that there's training for the young people in our communities, making mm -hmm. sure that they can go into trade school if there's no other options for them, making sure that these people are getting the support from their community that they need and uplifting them rather than forcing them into desperate situations where they feel like they have no other option. Exactly. And like, so what Donna read on the restorative justice website, which talked about after school programs, that's exactly what that is. So you have to remember, so obviously we can't fix the picture tomorrow mm -hmm. because if the dad is in jail and the mom is working two jobs to be able to put food on the table for her kids, then after school programs are really important because when kids are left alone, um, they can be easily influenced by negative forces. So yeah. like if there was some positive after school programs to teach kids like certain traits or how to sew, how to balance a checkbook or things like that. It gives them something to do that's going to make them productive members of society later in life. And it works. It is proven to work. We all know the story about like, you put your kids in Little League, even if they end up hating it, they build a camaraderie with their other teammates and understand that, you know, this union of these other people that you don't even know can sometimes build this friendship and lead to a positive and healthy life. Yeah. Unless you just hate Little League. But yeah. <laughs> it's like... There's that, too. It's, there's that. <laughs> and on honest, honestly, this conversation that we're having is not new, like Donna said. Yeah. It just has the momentum right now. So we figured we'd take our podcast to try to push that message even further forward to our listeners. Because we do believe that the system... The one thing we know definitively is that the system is not working. We do. We do, we do know this. And we know that there needs to be change and this is the type of reform that we feel would be the best option. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I honestly urge you for anyone that does disagree to maybe come at us with some questions that could be addressed in yeah. the next episode. Because honestly, like I said, this is something that we're still learning a lot about. I did a lot of research today into what this means. But I think that by going and looking at these root and core causes, we'd actually be addressing the issues and helping our communities rather than over-policing and militarizing them because it's not working. It's not working, it's creating distrust and it's creating all sorts of conflicts. And I know that it's not what we're used to, but just because tradition exists, just because that's the status quo now, doesn't mean that it has to be forever because it's obviously causing a lot of core issues within our communities. Um, Coco, I want to turn this part over to you because you kind of want to talk about some solutions in yeah. quelling uh, white supremacy. Yeah. And, yeah. So one of the things is like, so obviously with what's happening in the world right now, we see, we're seeing a lot of racism and true, true racism. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, racism is, a, is a systemic problem that we need to dismantle. So um, one of the things that I wanted to say is I'm going to talk about it in a very specific scenario. How can I make it to where when I'm eating re eating food in a restaurant that somebody feels uncomfortable to say a black joke to where everybody in the restaurant can hear? For me, that is the true definition of racism. When it's someone comfortable enough to oppress a different group of people, um, that's, how do I stop that? How do I make that not happen? I can't put a law out there that says, um, oh yeah, like white people aren't allowed to make black jokes in restaurants. I mean, yeah, I could, but that doesn't really solve the problem, does it? Mm -hmm. It's because we have to recognize that there are systems in place that need to be changed. So you've all heard the conversation of like, instead of buying the white dolls in the store, like buy the black dolls so your kids are exposed to black people early on, even if you live in white neighborhoods. You also hear about the idea of like having diversity training for teachers so they can handle issues of black students, you know, that they don't necessarily, um, that they so they have better skills of dealing with those issues. But here's the one thing that I really do think. So as I became, so as I've become an adult, I've recognized that a lot of companies don't really have an anti-oppression or diversity training. But what I've also recognized is there is not just really a there's not a threshold for black and brown faces to actually work in places. My my really revolutionary idea, because I know people are just gonna hate this, is that I really do think that there should be a minimum threshold for diversity at every company's. I really think that when you, if you have a company um, of a certain number of people, that some of those faces have to be brown or black or Asian or something like that. They have to be POC. Mm -hmm. And I really think that the government, just like we do with healthcare, there should be a tax if your company isn't meeting a minimum diversity percentage. Well, there should also be more diversity in our government. 
too. That also is true. There was a fact that I didn't even realize until I did some research on it that we've only had ten senators that are people of or that are black in our country in our entire country's history. Ten. Gosh, that's very uncomfortable ten. to hear. It is, and like we really do need to understand that when you people are exposed to something they're uncomfortable with, it oftentimes will make them change their mind about how they view it. Mm -hmm. So even if your dad or your grandma is racist as all get out, when you are exposed to working with people from a different walk of life, it usually ends up changing your view of them because you have to. Mm -hmm. It does. Like, it just happens naturally. It's organic. And Mm -hmm. that's how communities can grow. So the problem to solve racism, like, sure, we can have laws and policies in place, but it's not going to stop that person from saying the black joke at the restaurant. It's about putting black and brown faces and POC into positions of power, putting them all around you so you can see what it's like to live on the other side of the train tracks. Yeah. And right now, what I've re- what I've really noticed is you can tell, you can tell when somebody is adamantly against it. And they're all just called, like, not to get into this conversation, but they're all just microaggressions. Yeah. Like, you'll hear it in the phrases of, like, I don't date black girls. Or you'll hear it is she's pretty for a black girl. You'll hear it as like that one black kid in my high school. Um, you hear th- you hear these microaggressions, and it really does shape how somebody views it. Um, he wouldn't, um, you know, the police wouldn't mess with you if you didn't break the law. Um, you know, if he pulled his pants up, like he he would have been fine. If he wore if he wore a more professional hairstyle, um, if he laid low, you know, stuff like that. When you hear those comments, it's because these people haven't really been exposed to black people in black culture. And I really feel like we need to make an adamant effort to change that forcibly. Change that. Integrate. I mean, it's all about integration. It's a new frontier, as we said in the 70s. But like, it's it's here. It's here now. We need to make these adamant changes because people are literally dying mm-hmm. in the streets. Yeah. And like, as much as we want the government to fix that, that is definitely a people problem. It is. It is. It starts with us. It starts with our communities. And I, I think that's... I mean, it goes back to even the systems that we were talking about earlier um, to implement with reform. It, it goes back to the communities and it, it goes um, as far as us holding each other accountable. And you know what's beautiful that I've kind of seen um, is that witnessing at these protests, it, there is a sense of community. Yeah, you, you see yeah, there is. You see people caring for one another, you know? And you see when people act out and, and act violently in an instance that's not necessarily because not necessary because we're peacefully protesting, they tell them to stop. The protesters grab them and hold them accountable for what they're doing. If, if the march is designated to be peaceful and to try and get a message put across, pe- the protesters will hold the people who are rioting accountable for what they're doing, especially if they're doing it just to incite violence and to incite a riot. Right. And it's, and I know, here's the thing though, and I want to say this to every person out there who's really against rioting and yeah. violence or even protests to be, to be truthfully honest. We've tried every other mechanism to get our message out there and to be heard. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't actually want a repeat of Soma. I don't want peaceful protesters to be tear gassed and then mm-hmm. that gets hit on the 11 o'clock news and now you care. Yeah. How about instead of preaching on Facebook that you want to see peaceful protests, mm-hmm. you get your butt out there to make a difference and protest along with them. Yeah. You also support them and their causes and their actions. You ask your workplace if they have an anti-oppression or diversity training. You write letters to your representatives to ask them what they're doing about all the racial injustices in this world. You maybe even participate in defunding the police so you can have a better community for yourself and your loved ones. Yeah. There are ways. And one thing I will say, it's a hindrance and really unnecessary noise when you're going on Facebook and trying to pretend that you're a part of the cause when you haven't actually really stepped foot out your door. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, yeah. Are, And I will say there are other ways to protest, like I said. So your protest could be that you wrote about 50 letters in a week to your representatives. You can make a difference. We all can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, do we want to talk about organizations that we could look at following that... Yeah, definitely. So the first one that I want to talk about, obviously, is uh, Care Not Cops. Um, number one, I love that name. Um, yeah. they, along with Don't You PDX, um, organize, helped organize the, 
um, speakers today, and they did uh, prioritize brown and black faces to actually speak on the microphone today, mm -hmm. and that was just beautiful and wonderful. But Care Not Cops is the first one that I want to recognize here in Portland that is doing some great work. Yeah. Please donate to them and give you give them your support. Yeah. Also, uh, Don't Shoot PDX and um, the uh, ACLU both have um, Instagram pages to follow. I'm sure they also have Twitter pages that you can follow. You can basically look at uh, what they're trying to achieve through those organizations. They're doing some really great things as far as organizing goes during this time and really getting everyone on the same page and, and delivering um, a, a, a great message about what we want to see out of this movement. Yeah. Um, the last one that I want to talk about is the NAACP of Portland. Um, they organized the very first, I think it was the first, like, demonstration with speakers and things like that. They had signs and everything, and they, um, it was really good because they were working with government to actually have speakers as well, and um, it was really touching. I watched some of it myself. Um, a lot of these protests or demonstrations are happening in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I work and it sucks. So I have to like watch everything on a live feed. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't be a part of the action. But, um, you know, going in at night is fun. But I really would love to be there in person to listen to demonstrators and listen to the conversations For sure. during the day. So uh, we are going to go on to our Feed the Positive segment. I, like I said, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to write into to us. We uh, would definitely like to answer any questions and also do some more research on ourselves on this topic. Um, and you can contact us at... Um, you can actually comment on this episode specifically on our website at a gem of a secret podcast.com. That's a J E M of a secret podcast.com. You can just click on comments underneath this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can have civil dialogue and discourse back and forth. And yeah. maybe your question might end up in a bonus episode or an episode. Yeah. And also feel, feel free to comment under the YouTube link as well. Um, because yes. we will, we will check both of those. Um, we get notifications for both of those. Uh, our, my Feed the Positive this week is going to be uh, the only Natalie, Natalie Simone. Coco brought her up earlier in this episode. She was the third member of our little girl group that we had, uh, Little Tricks, uh, back in Grand Junction. Uh, Natalie's also made the majority of the outfits that I wear, so I really want to give her props. She's an amazing seamstress. She also designed some really cool things and just overall is a talented and wonderful person. She has a great heart. And um, I am lucky to have her as one of my closest friends that I've had. So I really hope that you give her a follow. Also, um, she does do commissions as far as her work goes. So if there's something that you're looking for that you want made for you, uh, just uh, shoot her a DM. Ask her. Um, again, her uh, Instagram is the only Natalie. So my feed the positive this week is a Shaniqua Volt. Um, you can find Shaniqua Vault um, on Facebook, I believe. She doesn't have an Instagram. Um, it's S-H-E-N-I-Q-U-A and Volt. Uh, there's a lot of those Volt family members. Um, but yeah, Shaniqua is an amazing... Um, she's an amazing person. She she does um, jewelry. Um, she does know how to fix some hair. Um, I actually commissioned a dress from her recently that I still need to pick up as soon as quarantine's over. <laughs> um, yeah, but she's just so sweet and she's so great and she's so kind and she, she and she can cook. And like, this is like, she's just the greatest person. I super love her. I love Natalie too. I do miss our girl group. Yeah. I posted about her online today. Um, so I'll post pictures of both of them on our website at a gem of a secret podcast.com. Yes. Both very insanely talented entertainers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we do have a show on June 13th uh, called Introvert, also that's going to uh, be taking place. Keep an eye on that. You can buy tickets for that show still. Um, and we have a variety of talent, including uh, girls from Camp Wanakiki, RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a Dragula girl this time around? We do or, not have a Dragula, no Dragula girl this time. this time. But yeah, we try to get representation from all the different reality shows <laughs> for yeah. our shows yeah and i'm really excited about it and there's also a fundraising button um you can also donate to a fundraiser we're actually um trying to raise money for small businesses black businesses that might have been affected by riots um so you can donate to that on when you buy your ticket um it is on the ticket page as well so that is to buy your ticket it would be www.thecdsdrag.com forward slash introvert that's www dot the cdsdrag.com forward slash introvert all right 
I think that concludes our episode for tonight. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks everybody and rate us a five. Yes, please. Bye. This has been another episode of a Gem of a Secret podcast. The hosts of HM of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast.com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.